In this episode, we are going to talk about gender equality and bias with two team members from the Antarctic Fire Angel group. They are all fight fighters in the UK and in November they will be traveling to Antarctica to be the first emergency service team to ski to the South Pole. But I believe their mission is already an amazing success, thanks to all the work they've done talking in school, universities and companies about empowering and inspiring women and young girls. As they like to say, the why is the most important question. So stick with us to hear about this amazing team, because you can't be what you can't see. Enjoy! Sustainability at Work is a podcast about sustainability in the workplace and in companies. My name is Samara and I've been working with sustainability for almost 10 years. So welcome everybody to Sustainability at Work. Uh, welcome to my two guests from the Antarctic Fire Angels. Uh, I'm very, very uh, happy to, to have you here for this episode, especially because you are about to live on an incredible journey. So I know that these last hours before the trip are very, very uh, important. So thank you for taking the time and welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So in a few days, you will be leaving for an exciting journey to the South Pole for 45 days, skiing a thousand and a hundred uh, 1,130 kilometers at the temperature of minus 50 degrees and with wind speed of 60 miles per hour or worse. So I think the most important question is why are you doing this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the most common, it's, it's an important question and it's the most common question and it's the question that always makes us smile the most, I think, because Apart from, you know, it's a, it, not only is it just an opportunity of a lifetime, but our whys are the, the most important thing. And that is just um, it just inspiring generations, generations young and old to go and do something absolutely amazing. It doesn't have to be Antarctica, obviously. Um, it can be uh, something that just challenges you. But the main thing is, is that you find the courage to go and do it. So we're also very different team members. Uh, I'm the oldest, Bex is in the middle, and then Becky is the youngest. So we'd like to think that we're um, tackling a few age groups there. Um, I'm old enough to be Becky's mother. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, I exercise that right now and then, but there we go. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just important to us that, that we inspire all sorts of uh, different generations. And one of the most important things that we do is our um, schools initiative, where we go into schools and speak to uh, what is probably close to 10,000 children mm -hmm. now, isn't it? So over the space of the um, three or four years that we've been planning and plotting and scheming this, um, from DOT, the most important thing for us is, is getting into schools and inspiring them and then seeing role models as well. So one of our hashtags is that if you, you can't be it, you can't see it. And so we want to be people, um, we want to be representative of, of people that we want to inspire to get into male dominated roles, basically. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to be the first emergency service team uh, to ski to the South Pole. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so how did the idea came to be? How even... At the very beginning, why? What is that force that pushed you into this adventure? Well, we were actually inspired by another female team of um, crazy women who went to Antarctica in 2014. They were an army team called the Ice Maidens. Um, and uh, we go to a networking uh, weekend every year called the Women in the Fire Service. And uh, George and myself happened to be at the same weekend. I didn't know George at the time. Um, and one of these um, team members from the Ice Maidens was talking, she was a keynote speaker at this weekend and telling us all about her, uh, you know, this amazing trip to Antarctica, what they did, experience the you know, amazing pictures and videos. And um, uh, basically, obviously, it was hugely inspiring to everyone and particularly to George here, who um, then after the talk 
went up to um, the girls called Sophie and asked her if this was something that a bunch of firefighters could do who had never, ever done anything like this before and had no experience of it. And she said, yeah, of course it is. You know, just as long as you could, you know, you've got the time and you can work hard to do all the training and the learning research. Um, there's no reason why you can't do it. And that was where the idea was born, really. So um, I was there as well. But like I said, I didn't know George um, at the time. And then she went back and um, uh, there was another girl that was previously on the team at the time. Um, her and um, they both kind of conjured up a plan and went back to their fire services and um, I was approached through a WhatsApp group, an adventure group I was on, asked if I um, fancied this this new challenge. And I jumped at the chance, um, not probably not really knowing what I'd let myself in for at the time. Um, and then George did the same back in her um, fire service. And then that was that was where the team and the idea was born, wasn't it? Mm. So um, when things, are, you know, if things are going bad or I'm having a miserable day. In Antarctica, I know who I can shout at and blame now. That would be George. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. But uh, also, Georgina, I remember that you say uh, when you were presenting this at Nopla, actually, uh, you say that maybe that sparker was already when uh, you started uh, in your job, um, and people say well, that's not a job for a woman. Uh, so maybe that, that first no was the, the sparkle that also brought you in the end. And maybe all of you, but I remember that Georgina mentioned this. Mm. I think um, I, I think I, I, even as a young child, I was always that child that was always going, if you tell me no, I'll just go and do it anyway. And, and I, learned, I mean, my parents were very much, you know, quite traditional with the upbringing and, you know, you're making mistakes, then, you know, we told you so kind of thing. And um, but, you know, they were always there to support me and, and everything. But unfortunately, back in those particular decades, you know, that that it was that that them of the rules that that, that that was just what happened. You couldn't do certain, you know, a lot of things because you, you were a girl, you know. Um, and I found that incredibly frustrating, you know, and I was constantly wanting to challenge it all, even even as an 11 or 12 year old, constantly wanted to challenge it, going, well, what can I, can, why can't I be the first girl in the sea cadets and, and things where I lived? And um, and the, the answer was, well, that you're just not allowed, um, you know, and, where, and, and then they didn't feel empowered enough to actually challenge it themselves either, because that was the norm. You know, in today's society, I'd like to think we've come a bit further now and we're in a position to challenge norms a bit more freely. Um, and yeah, that can only be a good thing. Mm -hmm. One fun thing is that when I was very young in the primary school, uh, I, the firefighter came to our school to do a demonstration and I really wanted to be a firefighter too. <laughs> and I got the same response. <laughs> so, oh, funny. really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I, thought, I thought it really resonated with me. Um, so how how have, have things changed since you started and what are the changes that you have seen in these years, especially in the firefighters, but also... Not only is there just more firefighters. When I first joined um, or 25 years ago, I mean, we made the complement up to five female firefighters out of 1,500 firefighters. And and that was incredibly unique back then. Um, we were four women on the, all on the same training course, which was incredibly unique. And um, a bit, I mean, the first woman joined in 1986, and it's at that point that everybody's contract changed from fireman to firefighter, and which was quite a big turning point. And then, but it's taken a long time for women to come through into the fire service because we're still underrepresented, whether, you know, we've, we've made leaps and bounds and getting more and more women in, in the role, but we're still incredibly represented, uh, underrepresented, sorry. So when you go into schools and things like that, they, the, the, the young kids just don't actually see that there are many female firefighters. And normally with the questions that come across are, are you, are you a real firefighter? Do you do all the same things as the men? And that not only comes from the kids, but it also comes from the parents and the teachers. You know, so literally every school that you go into, you, you're having, you're, you're, you're repeating yourself the same message. You know, we've been around for many, many, many years. And yes, we do the same jobs as, as the men. The job, the job has changed immensely. And I think it does definitely attracts a different demographic of personality now that comes through. 
Um, so, you know, traditionally 25, 30 years ago, it would have been you know, a very masculine male job. Everything was incredibly heavy. There was nothing there that was user friendly, you know, and uh, even the training was very military um, and things. But now as equipment changes, the role changes, we do a lot more community fire safety. The, the focus is a much more humanitarian focus. So, you know, we still go to house fires. We still go to car crashes. We still go to water rescues. We still do all the things that we did all those years ago. Um, but it requires a more humanitarian approach now. And, uh, you know, and what you do before and after the jobs as well. So and that includes all the fire safety that, that we do as well. So we're very proactive in preventing fires um, as well as what happens after the fire as well. So I think that's, for me, been the biggest change. And, you know, there's been resistance to it. But those people that have been in for many, many, many years, um, you know, didn't want the change. They, they are now going or, or, or have already left and been, been gone for quite some years now. Um, and you can see the change happening just from installing that one little message where humanitarians, you know. I, I had a question going back to, to your trip um, to Antarctica. So what, what is your day-to-day -day, um, expectation? How, how, how is the trip going to be? Uh, I mean, from the food standpoint, what is the, what do you need to bring with you? Uh, what is... Uh, what are you going to eat? What are you going to drink? How is the, what you expect? Because I know you also did some training in Norway. Uh, so you, you know already a lot of what is expected and how, how did you train also? Yeah, we've done four cold weather trips in Sweden and Norway, sort of all building up to trialing different food, um, you know, what we can eat, how it survives in the cold. Because that's a bit, that's a big thing for deciding what food we're going to take is, how it is in the freezing cold so basically we've been trialing things by putting stuff in the freezer at home and then eating it the next day to see uh you know what it's like is it edible uh, has it completely changed cheese is a big thing we've been trialing um because cheese is great it's full of you know fat and calories so it's a good thing for us to to snack on during the day but not all cheese comes out great from the freezer <laughs> so um So yeah, so in terms of food, so it you know for breakfast we'll have we have porridge, but it's kind of like a, a super porridge I'd call it. So um you know we've got the baby we use ready ready break because um the oats are um, all grounded up, so it's actually lighter because we have to think about weight. Um, so we use ready break and then we add a load of stuff in it. So I think we've got chocolate chips in it. Um, linseed is it linseed? Yeah, linseed. Uh, peanut butter powder. What else is in there? Uh, well, we can put anything we want in. Oh, yeah. Really. Um, coconut yeah. milk, because obviously that's a lot higher in fat and calories than, than, than a normal powdered milk. So obviously all powders, basically. Um, and then we use, we, we have to melt snow. So the only way we can get any liquid, because obviously everything's frozen, is by melting blocks of ice and snow. Um, so we'll do that in the morning and then in the evening. And then we boil the water and then that, we pour that into our powdered mix, so our powdered porridge for breakfast. So we'll have that for breakfast, uh, along with many chocolate digestive biscuits, because they do quite well in the cold and they, they've got lots of calories in. Um, and then um, throughout the day, then we don't have sort of one stop for lunch. So what we do is we have something called a snack bag. So we're in that snack bag then because we just on, we're on the go for 10 hours um, with a, sort of we, we we ski for an hour and a quarter. Then we have a 10 minute break uh, where we'll sit down and have a chance to eat and drink. So in our snack bag, we uh, we all have a few different things. So it's a bit of a personal preference. Um, but I have a couple of flapjacks because they're full of, again, full of calories, fat, carbs um, and then a chocolate. So lots of different chocolate um we'll have cheese so the best cheese we found is edam or gouda so a kind of hard soft cheese that works the best with in the cold and then biltong as well so um a bit of dried cured meat works well as well out there isn't it mm. so that's that's pretty much it isn't it for our snack bags in yeah. terms of food so we'll use that so that we'll use that then throughout the day because it's really easy to just grab when you've got all your mittens on and you know you're you're trussed up to the nines and all your kit um And then for dinner, then we have uh, we use ration packs, so freeze dried food for a company, and um, we again pour our melted snow, so the boiling water, into that. And those packs are a thousand calories each, so it's quite a lot of food to eat. So we'll have that as well as um, like a recovery drink, so it's a hot chocolate that we have, 
Um, and then again, more chocolate biscuits. And we'll finish off our snack bags if we haven't eaten all of that by the end of the day. And then, yeah, and then in terms of sort of fluids as well. So we will obviously boil enough water in the morning so we can fill up a thermos flask um, and we'll have a thermos full of just water that we can drink throughout the day. Um, and in the, when we wake up in the morning or so, so when we go to bed at night, we'll boil enough water to fill up um, a, a Nalgene bottle, so a plastic bottle. And we use that as a hot water bottle to put in our sleeping bags. And then in the morning, we put a little um, hydration tablet in it. And then we drink down that in the morning then. So we've had a litre of fluid already before we start to start our day. Because we're kind of, we're aimed to kind of drink three litres of fluids a day to keep us hydrated. Um, and then in terms of calories, we're aiming to eat between five and 6,000 calories a day. And but we will still not be, that won't be enough food for us because we'll still be burning more like eight to 10,000 calories. So it is quite a fine balance, isn't mm. it? And um, I know when we did, when we were out in our, on our trips in Norway, I was hungry every day, every single day, every minute of the day. And George would be at the, but it, we'd be in the tent in the morning. And as soon as I woke up, George would be feeding me biscuits. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's a, it's a fine balance, I think, with the food. And it is a relate, relentless Thing as well you know we can't you know we're eating what we can but we can't eat our proper meals until we've we've melted all the snow and that boiled which can take what a good hour or mm, two really please. depending on the you know how cold it is and how frozen the snow is that sounds random but it, different snow with different ice melts different times so um so yeah so yeah so so it's a quite a hard task as well when you're really hangry and <laughs> you've got to wait you know for a couple of hours for the water to boil yeah, yeah and i remember also you you mentioned uh having to build up the tent very quickly because the sun is going down very quickly so everything is very time based yeah. uh, and very organized in, during the day i guess mm. and how much weight are you taking with you between food tents and everything uh well uh, every every ration pack weighs about a kilo so it'll be we're gonna we're going hopefully 45 days but we're taking contingency at the moment for uh 50 days so it's 50 kilos um and then fuel so food and fuel are the biggest two things and then sort of our pogs will end up weighing about 85 90 kilos so yeah quite a lot but you know the benefit is is that they get lighter and lighter they get one kilo lighter every day worth <laughs> roughly and, and the fuel um yeah and yeah so um but of course we're getting more tired so we won't yeah. necessarily feed it and because it's such a it's such a gradual decline in in weight then yeah unfortunately we probably won't feel it that no much, we won't <laughs> notice yeah, yeah. just yeah. depressing yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it took you four years of preparation what is that preparation uh what, what does it include there is also the fact that in the, those four years i think there is one part which i want to talk about after uh, about the talks that you mentioned going into the school which i think it's it's very very important but on the on the physical side what was the preparation there uh well it's all our uk based training so that is, that consists of um t t dragging tires around the countryside um, which actually used to get us quite a lot of looks, didn't it? But now not so much because people people just go morning or afternoon or whatever. You know, <laughs> nice to see you. And um, and then all our strength based training as well, then endurance training, and a lot of it is based around the capacity to just go out and not listen to music and go out for a four hour tire pull and be bored <laughs> and be happy with your own company and and things. So, uh, you know, and the fitter that you stronger that you are, the better you will cope mentally as well. Because if your body isn't struggling, then it, it, it helps with the mind as well. So that's all our UK based training mostly. Plus, um, we do a, little, a few side sports on mm. the side. I mean, so Beck swims. I've gone as many times a week. I don't know, but she's like a fish. Yeah, um, I do different uh, d different types of stuff. Like I go running with my dog and and, and things like that. So, um, so and then our, there's our cold weather training then so it's been a combination of going to sweden and to norway and scotland as well we've been to scotland um and literally just going out checking our equipment because you know our equipment is new to us you know we learned how to do this four years ago and so all the equipment that that we've been getting over the last four years we need to go out and test that and what we need and adjustments and little bits and pieces like down to the feeding pouch that you keep within your jacket to keep all your treats warm 
and things, you know, how that works for different people. One size doesn't fit all as well. So the way that I snack through the day is very different to the way that Beck snacks through the day and, and the way that Becky does as well. So and what we like to eat and drink. So because we're so different as individuals, we're having to really address that difference when it comes to it. So, but the, if we're that hungry, I'm sure I'll, I'll eat your food. <laughs> but it's more likely to be the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so our, all our cold training. So we went to Sweden and we did some cold water training as well, where we jumped into an ice hole. <laughs> yeah. And um, and we're all really competitive with each other. So obviously Bex did three minutes, so we all had to do three minutes then. <laughs> and, or three minutes and one second or something, I don't know. Um, so we did that that was um, basically teaching us how, if you get into a state of hypothermia, how helpless you are and how reliant you are on your on your teammates to be able to help you and identify that, that symptom in you. Um, so that was quite a big lesson, actually, because we all came out and felt like we just had bricks on the ends of our arms and the de- you'll lose all your dexterity and, and things. So that was a, an important lesson. And then in the afternoon, when we just warmed up, we got to jump in all over again. And uh, But then we just jumped in and then we jumped straight back out and got dry again and, and, and off we went. So that that was good. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the pinnacle of our training has been three weeks in Norway um and the second week in Norway was pretty brutal but mm. necessary um we deliberately go into storms basically to try <laughs> and experience them we deliberately go in, into these environments to so we know to how to get ourselves out of it how to cope in it know and to learn how to trust ourselves and our decision making um so yeah Norway's second week was minus 30 in a tent for about five days and yeah, you questioned all your life choices. First thing in the morning, it's like even the cooker didn't make any difference to the tent, really. And you're looking at the thermometer and you're like, well, OK, it's minus 30. Now it's gone up to minus 27. <laughs> what, what do you do? <laughs> um, yeah, so you're questioning all your life choices then. And it's still dark as well. So Norway was very, very hard training, but in a sick kind of way, really enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In a weird way, yeah. In a, in a weird, weird, weird way, yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. Actually, I remember that you are not the first guest in this podcast that went to Antarctica uh, because there was another uh, woman. Uh, she is. She came to the podcast uh, talking about sustainability in, this, in uh, space uh, because she's studying climate change and space traveling uh, for uh, for NASA and for other agency, and she went to Antarctica for two weeks in a very different way, much more comfortable mm-hmm. than you, uh, but to study <laughs> the effect of, of climate change and create awareness on climate change. Yeah. Mm. Oh, right. Yeah. Anyway, so but talking back about awareness, uh, also in these four years, or I don't know when you started, but you visited a lot of schools and university what kind of talks do you give what kind of topic you talk about what is the the feedback you get from students of different ages um so we obviously we talk about our expedition you know who we are what we're doing and um, the kids find that really interesting you know where we're going we talk about antarctica as, as a lot of schools are doing um frozen planet as part of their um, curriculum so we talk about you know the actual continent and a little bit on climate change as well so you know so they've got an understanding of that uh, we talk a bit about sustainability so how we're trying to minimize our packaging and things and uh, our work with NOFA actually um and we also talk about being firefighters because obviously we're female firefighters and a massive thing for us is visible visibility um and you know how gender shouldn't be a barrier to you know trying to achieve things doing things it shouldn't limit you basically in what you want to do and um, so that's quite a big thing mm. for us isn't it um so we have some really interesting questions of of the uh of the pupils so a lot of the schools we go into are primary schools um so it's some really interesting questions, mainly about how we go to the toilet is probably the biggest question that we get asked, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, and the, and what we eat as well, because people are obviously really interested in what, what we eat um, and how, you know, how we cook and, and how we live out in Antarctica. Um, 
yeah and then you know so moving on to the university so we're working with university west of england bristol and cardiff met university and um on two quite different projects really aren't we mm. with with university west of england or ue we're working on sort of more social based project isn't it how we interact as a team how we're you know mm. basically how how we're going to deal with things out there as a group and the dynamics of that and things i think mm. sort of more of the mental psycho- psychological aspect um and we've also um worked with some schools that are partnered with that university as well so doing talks with them as well um and then with cardiff met we become part of one of their nutrition degrees so we actually there's a module now on us on developing um the food that we would need for antarctica so they've sort of got a brief about you know the amount of calories that product needs to be how it needs to you know obviously it needs to taste it be able to taste good because we've got to eat it every day pretty much um it's got to be able to survive you know the journey so um you know what it's made out of and everything it's got to be able to survive the journey and it's got to obviously able to survive the extreme cold environment so um and I think there's a bit of sustainability within that module mm. as well. So I think about the pack, you know, what we're going to package it in, things like that. So, um, so yeah, so so we've, we've done quite, and, and also now I'm working on another project with Cardiff Met as well about technology. So taking some kind of monitoring day, uh, technology with us for them to monitor sort of the physical aspects of us. So as as individuals, so the performance kind of aspects, as well as, more of about the climate as well and and the things and weather so um we've just started talking about that now so we'll see where that goes as well so yeah some really interesting stuff actually has come out of us just doing this this challenge and uh project so yeah it's been good and there's not much data out there about women female explorers in extreme mm. conditions at all it's all and some of the data that is out there is has been done by the british army and of course they 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 protect their, their data to a certain degree so you know it's not always accessible to to people like us so when people ask us you know what data have you got what are you taking with this and we're like well we're kind of we, we're we're basing all or what we're doing on outlines of what other people have done and they're mostly men so um yeah so hopefully we we'll come we'll come back with a lot of data and it'll enable a lot of other female women female expeditions to to go and and do these things that are a bit and they, they'll be a bit more informed on on how what and how and what they should take you know even down to hormones and mm. you know periods and menopause and and, and all sorts of uh, things like that mm. so they just become more informed and not so scared of it as well because that's that's something that puts a lot of women off mm-hmm. So you created a charity to collect at the beginning three hundred thousand pound for the trip. Is that correct? Uh, how how the charity works and how it will work also after the trip? Yeah. So uh, the fundraising, the fundraising raising is the hardest bit. <laughs> the, you know, you have to enjoy the training because it's four years of it. But no one ever told us that that there was going to be this much heartache when it came <laughs> to fundraising. And if there's any feedback we can give to any future expedition team, it, it's 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 like I, d- I don't know, get a, get a professional fundraiser or something. And give <laughs> yeah, them a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pay someone to do it. Pay someone to do it. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah so obviously when we very first started out we were a team of six and that was what half a mil wasn't it yeah, yeah. and then covid hit and then it become became incredibly unrealistic um to, to raise that sort of that, those sort of funds um but just through people um through their own commitments taking promotion um i mean this is another job basically um so taking promotion um and some you know somebody deciding that it wasn't quite for them as well and also nikki with her frostbite and so she physically could not go because it makes her more vulnerable we're we're down to three so obviously makes it a lot cheaper doesn't it so um so the fundraising wise i'm not sure how much have we got left to go now it's around 80 yeah yeah it's around 80k which in the scheme of things um actually isn't that much compared to the entire cost of the expedition and most of that cost is actually um, logistics, uh, permits and fuel for when we actually get into Antarctica itself. Getting there is actually quite cheap. The expedition is actually quite cheap, but the food and the, sorry, the fuel and the flights and the permits are the most expensive things. Plus, you have to uh, pay to pay to be on, a tar- uh, on Antarctica per day as well. So you have to pay for the privilege to be on Antarctica on a daily basis as well. 
So that they're, they're the most exp expensive things. And I can only say, I mean, yeah, boohoo first, but <clears throat> it's probably a good thing because it, it is so expensive, so not many people go there. <laughs> To, to be fair, and um, you know, and the people who do go there have worked really damn hard to, to get there and appreciate absolutely everything that goes on there to keep Antarctica the most precious planet, but, but a precious place on the planet, um, the way that it is now, you know, and and for future as well. Yeah, yeah that, that was one of my questions because we have seen a lot about Himalaya and closing for waste, uh, for the waste problems and more and more people there. Um, a lot of rescue team uh, going to save people who had no idea what really expected them there. Uh, so I, I was wondering, especially for the waste problem, I know you you had in your four years of training, you have seen already some something there. What 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 would you share with us of how the maybe the industry could change and what is needed, uh, especially from the packaging and and the uh, and the waste standpoint for the outdoors really. Mm, cool. Um, well, if, as particularly for our type of expedition, um, you obviously you you buy your say your freeze dried food or all the things that we buy. We have to you know weight is a massive issue, so you're basically taking taking the packaging pouring out the contents into another plastic bag because plastic small plastic bags are light um, and then you're putting you know you, you've got all these little plastic bags that you've got all the different meals in and bits of food and then you put that into another plastic bag which is then you know that that's your one bag then for the day and then you might put that plastic bag along with another seven in another bigger bag which is your week's worth of food so the amount, you know, I don't think until we started doing this, we never realised the amount of plastic that we are getting through um, because there is no other, there isn't really any other option. And, you know, because of the, because it's a bit of weight and, and sort of, you know, how we fit everything into our small sort of pulp, um, that is the only way that you can carry your food. So, you know, we... We've looked at trying to do uh, trying other options, and if there's anything else out there, and there isn't really. And it wasn't until really we've started, uh, you know, working with with Knopfler that with their seaweed packaging that that's that 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 could possibly be the the future of that. You know, obviously there's lots of research and and market research that needs to be done into it. But I hope that we are now we're using um, a sort of a, a, a seaweed packaging for our hot chocolate sachets. And, you know, we'll use that now out in Antarctica and trial that. And we hope that maybe that might be the start of, of something that will move forward into the future. Because, you know, as, as time goes on now, Antarctica is, is getting more and more accessible for expeditions, for just for holidays now. You know, tourism in Antarctica is becoming quite a big thing because uh, it is more accessible. You know, there's more flights now. Uh, people want to go to uh, more and more extreme places i think especially after covid you know people want to go and see the world don't they and um and you know the flip side to that is that there is going to be more and more packaging and plastic so it you know i think there needs to be something developed quite quickly and i hope that we're kind of a small part of that development to find something for that for the for the plastic issue because you know somewhere like Antarctica which is beautiful and and not untouched but is one of this one of the few places probably in the world now that is is suffering from climate change but in terms of waste I think they're trying to keep it at bay but you know the more the people more people go there the, the the more difficult it's going to be to keep it that way I think so it has to be something a different a uh, different way to to carry the food, package the food, um, more sustainable mm. way, I think. I think as as well, it's obviously, I mean, we fly in and out of Punta Arenas, from Punta Arenas into, onto Union Glacier, you know, and it, and it's that, it's Punta, it's Punta that actually has to bear the brunt of most of that, um, that burden of plastic packaging as well, because everybody gets to Punta and starts repackaging their food ready to go to fly onto Antarctica and so they're left with all of all of that waste you know and we've got no idea where that waste goes yeah. I mean we're kind of spoilt in the UK because we can track where all our waste goes you know and we, you know our local authority come and pick it up and, and it's there and it, and it goes in, into the into the recycling plant but we we don't know we we don't know that for sure what happens in other countries 
And I, for one, I couldn't walk away from pile of plastic bags thinking, oh, well, I don't care what happens to that. It's not my country. I, I can't, I cannot, I cannot do that. And, and of course, when we get onto Antarctica, don't tell me for one minute that everybody has managed to come back with absolutely every single bag that they went out with. Um, you know, so it's, we, I mean, we all know what happens with, with microplastics and, you know, it breaks down for generations to come and then we're, we end up eating it again. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of research to be done, as Beck mm. said, um, but hopefully this is the start of it. And it's the start of rethinking things on how, on how um, it takes effort to change stuff. And, um, and hopefully if we make, if we make the big enough effort, the people will just follow, follow along and go, that's a damn good idea let's let's do that as well because it's not actually that hard to make that change and um you know and, it, and quite frankly it makes you feel a bit smug yeah <laughs> it does make you feel good that you're doing yeah. something yeah. yeah yeah it's a good yeah. feeling and i think that's really also one of the things that an expedition like yours can really show uh, just to focus the attention on that problem hopefully more and more companies will try to to solve that and fix that so maybe in the next trip you will have a, more solutions to that um <laughs> so i guess m- m- i was wondering if in these four years talking in school institution different things you have seen some nice case studies or positive implementation of projects for um, to fight gender stereotypes or uh, bias because sometimes and that is my perception sometimes a lot of the project go from, from top down in many companies and entities and different things um, from top down and they don't work so much they seem repetitive uh, applied in the same way in different companies uh, while your project is very um, based on also your push and your uh, your uh, your uh, really your experience and your story, your personal story, and from that it went to the whole organization, to the network you were able to create in these four years. So how is is different? I, th- I think it's different, and so, I think somehow the project that starts like yours are more powerful and have more. Are more effective. What is your view on that? You have seen, I guess, a lot of projects. Oh, I think, I think, as you say, you, you know, if, if you need push from the top down, but you also need push from the bottom up, bottom up, you know, and where the where the bottom up because we're you know we're reliant on funding sources from corporations, for, you know, to give us um, to, to to back us in order to go and do this, and but you know we we need to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And getting into schools and institutions, um, you know, companies as well, and making that really, making that message quite clear that um, it cannot be a tick box. You know, inclusive culture is not just a tick box. It is something that needs to be embraced and encouraged. And you know, and, and it's about calling it out as well. You know, and not to be criticised for calling it out. You know, if you're not comfortable with something, or you see somebody else that isn't comfortable with something, then you know that needs to be called out and and again it's about having an adult conversation about it it's not necessarily about having an argument or even a heated discussion it's about having an adult conversation about it and passing on the knowledge that you have to that individual because they may actually have no idea of what they're doing so you cannot criticize somebody who had doesn't have that background of knowledge in the first place so it's about arming them with their with that information, with that knowledge. Knowledge is power at the end of the day. And and you know, bit by bit, we'll have a more inclusive culture and society, I think. I think the other thing, I think over the last four years, um, you know, because one of our big things is being visible, um, especially in, in the fire service and, and visible um female firefighters to the wider public. And I think over the last four years we We've definitely had uh, a lot more females um, messaging us on sort of social media, um, you know, asking for advice, saying that, you know, the, the kind of the reason they decided to go for the fire service is because they follow us and they've seen, you know, they've seen us doing doing things. And um, we've almost also cu- almost come a li- a li- like a little bit of a, a help kind of forum <laughs> for a lot of female firefighters. Um, 
which is really nice, which is brilliant, you know, and that's what, you know, that's what we hope that this will do as well is for us to be visible and, and people then kind of see that females can do that job and they can, you know, have a role like, like we do. And, um, and they feel that they can approach us and ask us questions of things and we can help other females get into the fire service as well, because that's a big thing for us, isn't it? So definitely over the last four years, I think that that, that has been a big thing that we we've done and achieved i think which is really great isn't it mm. um and i think from the spin-off from that as well is um when you talked about a we're trying to build sort of a um foundation that um so you know we, we've kind of got the bare bones of it at the moment and then you know that's what we want to continue sort of a legacy after antarctica so it's not just about us going on this big trip in the cold you know that's just kind of us grabbing attention and and having something to talk about but it's more about why we're doing it and what we stand for yeah and then going forward you know after the trip so um we, we're trying to build a foundation called the fire angels foundation or fa for short um and within that we is kind of um you know we'll, we'll build on sort of um, young firefighters so we, our services have the cadets cadet corps which is sort of young firefighters 13 to 17 um, so we'll kind of help them and work with them after giving talks and, and sort of building up a program over three months. And they'll get to have an experience like we've had on a smaller scale. But not only that, now we're trying to build it to become almost a bit of a hub for, for female firefighters or anyone involved in the fire and rescue service who all wants to be involved to kind of chat, come and chat and, and speak to us about things, any issues, etc. that kind of thing. So almost for like well being as well. But because there isn't really anything out there for female firefighters in the country, I think, nationally. So um almost that kind of thing. So um, you know, that's what we're hoping to start basically. So we're kind of got the bare bones at the moment and then we want to build on that from from Antarctica, basically. And I think this is a perfect uh, place to 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 finish and also talk, talking about uh, the future. But I wanted to. I, uh, how many days uh, do we have before the trip? Oh, it's November. November. Yeah, it's November. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so depending on when this uh, will be published, I guess you might be in the journey or you might be almost leaving. So where can people follow your adventures? <laughs> so they can follow us we've got a website so antarcticfireangels.co.uk um, and we hope to have a map on there with a little tracker so you can actually track our progress throughout the journey um, and also on social media so we're on instagram facebook uh, linkedin and twitter so uh, they'll all have the same on there so antarctic fire angels you will find us on all of those so that you can track our progress follow our journey or just find out any information about us as well perfect thank you so much Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good luck on the trip and on the last day preparing everything. And thank you for ma so much for giving me some time uh, to share this uh, amazing uh, journey with uh, all our viewers. Thank you both. Um, and and uh, yeah, good luck on the trip. Thank you thank so you. much. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.